of those that are the common ones that people talk about every day. You need to know this is true if we're going to base your faith on this. And I would submit to you, if you're not basing your faith on this book, that you're not following Christ. You might be following something that you attribute to being Christ, but it won't be the Christ of the Bible if you don't know what this is and don't believe that it's true. A lot of the problem that we've got that I've experienced just in the last several weeks is that people that say they are, they are Christ followers that are having problems with their understanding of salvation question whether there are parts of this are really true or not. And let me just tell you, if not all of this is true, then who's going to determine what is true and what's not true? Where do you stop? Do I make the rules? Does Scott make the rules? Who, Who's going to make the rules here? Who's going to lay, lay out the line and say, this is where I stop believing this book? If you don't know why you believe this, I would just encourage you to dig in and start finding out why you can be, have absolute faith in this. And then when we start talking about what we're going to talk about this morning, and that's salvation, you, you can pick up and say, well, I need to, if, if I believe this, I need to go by what this says about salvation, not what I've heard somebody else say about salvation. It, it hurts me on two accounts where a lot of people, and I would even say the majority of the people in churches across America this morning fall into one of two camps. The first camp is what Dietrich Bonhoeffer called the easy believism camp. I walked the aisle when I was a kid, and the preacher had me say a prayer, and I said it in Jesus' name, and therefore I'm saved. He told me I was saved. And let me just say to you, that may or may not be true. But just because you said words... Just because you said a prayer, just because you used the name of Jesus at the end, does not make you saved. So that's the first heresy. I walked the aisle, I said a prayer, now I'm saved, everything's cool, I don't have to worry about anything, I got my ticket to ride. I'm ready to go. And now I can live my life any way I want. I'm not hungry for the word, so I come to church occasionally. I'm not, I'm not encouraged to, to share my faith with anybody because that's just, boy, that's sticky when you do that. It's, it's uncomfortable sometimes when you do that, so I don't want to do that. I, I would call myself a good person. I, I asked a leader in a church that in the last two weeks, how do you know you're going to heaven? Because in the conversation, it just it wasn't, it wasn't ringing true. How do you know you're going to heaven? And his answer was, I'm a good person. A leader in a church. And then amongst all this bombardment of these conversations I'm having with people, I see this new Barna study. Oh my goodness. I'm going to tell you part of it this morning. What do you believe and why do you believe it? Let's get into some of this. Salvation. If you walk the aisle and say the prayer, you're assured of salvation. That's the one heresy. The other heresy that, that I'm dealing with right now is that that says, I can never really know if I'm going to heaven. I can't be assured. I can lose my salvation. I'm, I'm hurting because... I don't know if I'm really saved or not. I was sincere and all the evidence is there. The Holy Spirit's moved in and he's working through me, but I'm, af I'm afraid I'm not really saved or I'm afraid I lost my salvation back there somewhere. And may I go back to where I started this morning? This book assures you that if you, indeed you are saved, you are eternally saved. Christ says to us, nobody can snatch you from his hand. So one of those two heresies, I would, I would just say to you, dominates the thought processes of people sitting in most of the pews in churches this morning. 
They're either haunted by the fact that they feel like, they feel like, they don't know a fact, they feel like they aren't saved or they feel like they've lost their salvation, or they're so confident and cocky in their faith they don't need anything else. They don't need to know Jesus better. They don't need to have a relationship with him that's deeper. And therefore, everything's cool. My ticket's punched. And both of those things scare me to death. And as a pastor, I got to address this this morning. And I, and I want you to put your own fingers on your own pulse. Don't sit there and think about anybody else this morning. Put your own fingers on your own pulse this morning, your spiritual pulse, and ask yourself the important and pertinent questions concerning your salvation. Because I don't want anybody to leave here in either of these two camps. I want you to know that you know that you know Jesus Christ. I want you to have that assurance this morning when you leave here. Here's some false thoughts that you can work through. I will know by I'm saved by how I feel. Well, here's my problem. Some mornings I get up feeling like a more super Christian than I do other mornings. Some mornings I get up and I just don't feel like the super saint. And if I'm going by my feelings... My feelings can't dictate my faith. My feelings can't dictate if I'm going to follow Christ today or if I'm going to trust him today, if I'm going to believe today. I will know I'm saved by the works I do. I do these good works so that I might be saved. That's where the Mormons are. That's where the Jehovah's Witnesses are. That's where Roman Catholicism is where a lot of people sitting in good, solid, Bible-believing churches, sitting in the pews this morning, that's where they are. And if that's where you are today, I want to tell you, your works will not get you to heaven. I will know I'm saved because I went forward at the Christian camp when I was a kid. I will know I'm saved because I was born into a Christian home. How many times have I heard that? I was born a Christian. No, you weren't. Can I just set you straight this morning? No, you weren't. Your mama might have been the best Christian that's ever lived, but you weren't born a Christian. That doesn't pass through the bloodstream of your mama's womb. You have a free will choice. I've always been a Christian. No, you haven't. Christians can be defined by the, being extremely nice people. I, listen, I know some really nice people that aren't Christians. Some of them, frankly, put me to shame. <laughs> Some people will think, if they come in here this morning, that I'm not being very nice as I preach this message. As niceness goes. I'm a Christian even though I don't know about God or any Christian doctrine. I've had pastors in this region tell me that doctrine is not important. What are they saying? This is not important. This is where doctrine comes from. So what are you basing your faith on if this isn't important? What are we basing our faith on? Well, it's based on how I feel. I go to church and they have this wonderful thing by, called a praise team. And, and, and listen, I love praise teams. I do. I wish we had somebody here to, to play and, and, and have a praise team. I do. But how that praise team juices you up is not a measure of your faith. If it gets your adrenaline run, running. Last Sunday morning, some of you know Robin Brooks was here. And he walked up and he put something in my hand. I don't know if he did to some of you as well. And uh, it was this. Gold nugget. 
And no matter how hard he squeezed this in my hand or how much I wanted it to be a gold nugget, it's not, it's, a, it's fake. I was disappointed. <laughs> really, I was terribly disappointed. And if you put your faith in anything other than the true word of God, let me tell you, you're going to be disappointed. And this, this is the heartache for a pastor. I can't tell you how many people I've seen come into churches and they stay there a little while and then they leave. Why? Because they got this. They got something that looked good, it's shiny. They were encouraged at first. They thought it was real. But there was no substance to this because there was no genuine evidence for the fact that it was real. And so they become disillusioned. And they throw it away and they leave the church and they, worse than that, they leave the Christian faith. They leave a relationship with God because somebody told them something that was not out of here that they said was Christianity and then they became disappointed in that promise that was not Christianity that they thought was Christianity and now they've attributed that to Christ and now they've left. Well, I got disappointed with Jesus. No, you didn't. You got disappointed with what you thought Jesus said or who you thought Jesus was. But that's not what this says he is. Here's one I've heard. Love is the defining fact of Christianity. Love is a natural attribute of knowing Christ, but it is not the defining fact of Christianity. You will know them as an evidence because they love one another. It's an evidence, but it's not the defining fact of Christianity. It's not what you put your faith in. Here's the Barna poll I told you about. This, this is some shocking stuff. 57% of Baptists, that's Southern Baptist and others, believe works earn them salvation. 57%. I get to heaven at least partially by what I do. Excuse me? Barna is a poll that's taken primarily among Christian churches. 66% of Baptists don't believe Satan is a real being. Sixty-six percent don't believe Baptist, or don't but Baptists don't believe Satan is a real being. One of the things when I came here, Doug, Pastor Tom's son, asked me, said, "Is there anything in our statement of faith that you want to address?" And I had read over the statement of faith many times, but before he asked me that question, I said, "Well, I believe everything that's there, but I think the thing that's missing is we need a statement concerning Satan. Statement is not." Satan is not a figment of somebody's imagination. He's not a cartoon character with a pointed tail. He's not, he's a real person. There's a person of Satan that is genuinely at work in this world every day. We need to understand that. And 66% and of Baptists don't believe that. They believe that Satan is, is something that's in the Bible, but but it's just sort of a, an allusion to something evil. 59% of evangelical Christians, we're going to define what that is in a moment, don't believe in the total accuracy of the Bible, and there's the start of the problem. 59% of evangelical Christians, and you'll, you're going to see in a moment that only 8% of Baptists qualify as evangelicals. 23% of Pentecostals believe the Bible is, is uh, only 23% of the Pentecostals believe the Bible is totally accurate. Only 40% of those surveyed believe Christ was sinless. And they're only, they're only surveying people by, by their own definition as Christians. 
Does none of this shock you like it does me? I mean, this is Albert Moeller, Jr., past president of the Southern Baptist Theological Seminary and past president, too, of the Southern Baptist Convention, says this Barnapole is a striking indictment of the loss of doctrinal confidence and the erosion of biblical beliefs that mark American Christianity. We've got to be bold enough to say to somebody, even though it's not comfortable, the reason you need a savior is because you're a sinner. And people don't want to step on anybody's toes anymore. Listen, we're all sinners here, saved by the grace of Jesus Christ. And until you know the bad news, the good news isn't good news. You see? We've got to know what it is. We've got to know the truth. The study determined that evangelicals are scarce. Here's how Barna defines an evangelical. See if you fit this category. Put your finger on your own spiritual pulse now and see if you fit in this category. Barna defines evangelicals as a subset of born-again believers. In other words, of all the born-again believers, there's a small group that he's qualifying as what he's calling evangelicals. They are those who say their faith is very important in their lives. There's the first check mark or blank space. Is your faith very important in your lives? Now, let me, let me tell you some qualifiers here in these statements that, that they pointed out. They said, we're not asking, is your church, your personal church home important to you? We're not asking if the relationships with the people there are important to you. We're not asking you if you have fun when you go to church. We're not asking if you like the music when you go to church. We're asking you if your faith in Jesus Christ is important to you. Because there's some qualifiers there. There's some natural outcomes of your faith being important to you. There, there's a natural flow of things that are going to be true. Number one, the Bible tells us that your life's going to be totally changed. All the old things that passed away, they're... New things are new. These new uh, understandings, these new relationships, this new confidence that we have in our, in, in our salvation. And all the old things, it says, are passed away. So those that say that their faith is very important, secondly, that believe they are, have a responsibility to witness to non-Christians that believe each person that qualifies as an evangelical says their faith is important and as a result of their faith being important that it is important that they that and they have a responsibility to witness to non-christians they acknowledge the existence of satan they contend that eternal salvation is possible only through God's grace and not through good deeds, not through works. They believe Jesus Christ lived a sinless life on earth and describe God as all-knowing, all-powerful, perfect deity who created the universe and still rules and reigns over it today. Now, if all of those things are true in your life, you qualify as an evangelical. If any one of those things is questionable, even questionable, then you don't qualify as an evangelical. You may fit into the subset of born again, but you don't qualify as evangelical. Okay, those that fit in such category include only 8% of all adults. Only 8%. Only 14% of Baptists qualify as evangelicals. Only 14% of Baptists can say, my, my faith is important to me. I believe I have a responsibility to share my faith with the unsaved. I acknowledge the existence of Satan. I contend that, that er, eternal salvation is possible only through God's grace. I believe Jesus Christ lived a sinless life on earth and described uh, and I describe God as all-knowing, all-powerful, and, and a perfect deity. And only 14% of Baptists can do that.
No, they're, they're saying, this is what I believe, and my life reflects this. My life, if, it, listen, if, <laughs> let, let me go back and let's define what belief means. Belief means there's application, what Pastor Tom talked about this morning. Belief means I've put my life into the hands of Jesus Christ and what he says. I'm, I'm all over that. I'm all about that. Even if it's uncomfortable to me, even if it's not convenient for me, even if I have to learn some things in order to do those things, that this, this idea of belief is not just I have an intellectual assent to that. It is that I believe, I've, I've jumped in the wheelbarrow and I'm being pushed over Niagara Falls because I believe the guy can get me across. Okay. Here's the conclusions of Barna. The Christian body in America is immersed in a crisis of biblical illiteracy. Barna said, how else can you describe matters when most unchurched adults reject the accuracy of the Bible? Most, most church-going adults reject the accuracy of the Bible, reject the existence of Satan, claim Jesus has sinned, see no need to evangelize, believe that good works are one of the keys to persuading God to forgive their sins and describe their commitment to Christianity as moderate or even less. We're in crisis. And any, any Christ follower that looks at this, that understands this is where we are, this ought to build a fire under us. Because this is where we are. The most disappointing finding of the report, according to Barna, is the loss of doctrinal clarity among evangelicals. Here's what Moeller told Barna. He says, we have come to expect doctrinal compromise in liberal denominations, but we now see the same process at work among those calling themselves evangelicals. Year by year and moment by moment, we're slipping from what we say is the orthodox Christian faith. We've made it all about how I feel, and if I get a warm fuzzy in my belly when I go to church, then I had a good day. So what is salvation? Let's just take one part of this and talk about salvation this morning. Because this is the most... This is the most critical question anybody can ever ask in their entire life. Are you saved? Are you genuinely saved or do you fall into one of those two camps? I'm, I'm unsure and I just, I'm just afraid I've lost my salvation and I don't know. Or, hey, I'm okay. Click. I'm okay. Everything's cool. So what does the Bible say? about salvation. <clears throat> can it be earned? Can it be, uh, is it given to all? Universalists believe everybody's going to heaven, doesn't matter who you are, what you've done, what decisions you've made, who you follow, what you say, what you do, how you live. Because I said the right prayer, because I believe Jesus is real. Well, I believe Jesus is real, therefore I'm going to heaven. The Bible says even Satan believes that. I, I, listen, I want you to question this morning. I want you to put your finger on the pulse. And if there's anybody here this morning, anybody that is unsure, I want you to get with Pastor Tom or myself before you leave here today because I do not want you to walk out those doors unsure. I want you to know. I want you to know whether you're genuinely saved or not. If you walk out the door and you say, I know I'm genuinely unsaved, and that's your decision, that's your decision. But I don't want anybody to walk out the door confused today. Does that, does that make sense? Some say it can be earned. <coughs> Giving to the poor, feeding the hungry, going on mission, attending church. Here's what Ephesians 8 and 9 says. Let's go to the Bible, shall we? For by grace you have been saved through faith. Through faith. Now what is what is faith? Faith is always the subject of an object. You can't, have, you can't just have this ephemeral, I just have faith, everything's cool, I just have faith. 
No, I have faith in the person of Jesus Christ. His death on the cross, his burial in the ground, his resurrection and newness of life, and the atonement of my sins by his blood on the cross. That's what I've got faith in. It's not faith because I just have this feeling today. And I'm afraid that's where a lot of people sitting in churches are. I got this warm feeling today. It's great. I got my adrenaline flowing. It's by grace that you have been saved through faith. This is not of your own doing. It is a gift of God and not a result of works so that no one may boast. It's not a result of works. It is a gift of God. So faith is a gift of God that's given to you, and it's given to you, and, but like any gift, you choose whether to receive it or not. You choose whether to accept that gift or not. You can leave it sitting on the curb. God hasn't come in and overwhelmed you and forced that on you. It's a gift. We are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works. Well, there it says it. It's all about good works. No, listen. Good works come as a result of your faith and your life with Jesus Christ. It doesn't come to earn you a place with Jesus Christ. Are you with me? God prepared these works beforehand that you should walk in them. Do you know there's a whole lot of things God prepared for every single saint, every single person that accepts Jesus Christ? And most of us, and I'm guilty, end up walking past the majority of those every day of our life because our spiritual eyes aren't open to see God's got an appointment for us. He's got an appointment for us today. So how do you know the Bible's true? Mom said so, pastor said so. I just have this ephemeral faith. I feel pretty good today, so I believe it today. That's not what Ephesians 2 says. Here's Hebrews 11.1. It tells us that faith is, quote, being sure of what we hope for and certain of what we do not see. Now, I want to attack this word hope just a minute because in our English-American way of thinking, we think of hope as this sort of a, I wish it would be true. Here's the biblical definition, the Greek word here. You can, you can substitute it here if you like. Hope, substitute the words confident expectation. Faith is being sure of what we have a confident expectation of and certain of what we do not see. Does that say we have assurance? Yes, we're just supposed to have assurance. We're supposed to have confidence. John tells us at the end of 1 John, he says, listen, I've written all this stuff here so that you might know. That's the reason I put it here. I didn't put it here to make you feel good. He says, I told you all this stuff that you might know that you're saved. You might know if you're saved or not. In a sense, it's like the wind. This idea of faith is like the wind. You can't see the wind. You can't see the wind, but you see evidence of the wind. Elva and I lived through Hurricane Hugo. Came up across the East Coast. We were down at Hilton Head Island in South Carolina. They said it's going to come right over the island. We had our horses down there with us at the time, and I said, Let's load up the horses and head back to Charlotte. We'll be safe there, 200 miles inland. Loaded up the horses, got back to Charlotte, unloaded the horses. Here came the hurricane right over the top of Charlotte. I remember standing in my house looking out the window and watching that wind push those trees, those pine trees, all the way to the ground. And then it it would ease up and they would come most of the way back up and then it would hit again and then we'd go down again. You can't see that wind, but you see evidence of that wind. And God has left us evidence in his word. He's left us evidence by what he's done in this world. The Bible tells us we can look at the creation and see the evidence of a creator. This, this, is, this is what we, we have the evidence of these things being true. Even though we can't see the wind, we, we, we know it's there. 
Does anybody ever question the wind after, after it's gusted through and torn the shingles off your house? Was it there or not? I think it was there. But I can't see it. I can see evidence of it. Biblical faith is evidence-based. Let me say it again. Faith is not just a wish. Faith is not just an Americanized hope. Faith is, the, is built on the evidence of God's word and what he's left us, and if you don't know this is true, your faith is weak. What evidence do you point to for your faith? Put your finger on the pulse. Does your faith fluctuate with your feelings? Put your finger on the pulse. Because if it does, you need to fine tune this at least. In case you can't tell, I'm hurting today. My, my conversations with people the last several weeks has just been devastating. I'm not just talking about people in this church. I'm talking about people in churches all over. Good churches. I'm not talking about weak, mamsy-pamsy, non-doctrinal churches. I'm talking about good churches that teach the truth. Perhaps no other component of the Christian life is more important than faith. We cannot purchase it, sell it, or give it to our friends. As much as we might like to give it to our friends, we can't do it. So what is faith, and what role does faith play in the Christian life? The dictionary defines faith this way. This is interesting. Secular dictionary defines faith as belief in, devotion to, and trust in somebody or something. That's not a bad definition. Belief in, devotion to, Trust, I put my life into your hands and I say, do with me as you will and show me what you would have me do this day and I will abide by that. You are the Lord of my life. The Bible has much more to say about faith and how important it is. In fact, it is so important that without faith, we're told biblically, without faith we have no place with God and it is impossible to please him Hebrews eleven six. So would you say faith is important? Is it important we even know what it means? Is it important we know that it is evidence-based? Is it important that we know that it's not a matter of our feelings? According to the Bible, faith is belief in the one true God without actually seeing him. I see all the evidence for the fact that he is there. I see all of his word proving to be true. And I have faith in him. Hebrews 11.6 tells us that he rewards those who earnestly seek him. Knock and the door will be open to you. Seek and you will find. Never will forget one trip down through Black Township in Africa. And I met this guy there and he's he asked me a question, I won't go into that story, but he asked me a question that I gave him an answer to that the Holy Spirit had only shown me that morning. Amazing. And he said, everybody that's come by here trying to tell me something about their religion, I've asked them that same question. And nobody's ever been able to answer it. And what you have said, I have evidence for in my life. I've, I've seen what you're talking about. And so I can believe in this Jesus. It's an evidence. The rewards earnestly seek him. And here's what that man said to me. Everyone that's come by here, he said, I've asked them. I've been seeking an answer. And no one's had the answer. And I didn't have the answer before a few hours before. Reading my Bible, the Holy Spirit impressed this upon me. And I went, wow, that's... That's a new revelation to me. And then I go out and I see this guy and I have a conversation with him in his own yard and he accepts Christ. 
This is not to say that we have faith in God just to get something from him. However, God loves to bless those who are obedient and faithful. We see a perfect example in Luke 7.50. Jesus is engaged in a dialogue with a sinful woman when he gives her a glimpse of why faith is so rewarding. Your faith has saved you. Go in peace. The woman believed. The word there means trusted him. That means she put her life in his hands. That means she didn't just have an intellectual sense that she believed that Jesus was real, but that she believed in Jesus as Lord. Did you get this? Did you get the difference? She didn't just believe that Jesus was real. (laughs) She believed in Jesus as Lord. And Jesus Christ by faith, and he rewarded her for this faith. So what is the barometers of our trust? Let's look at three passages of Scripture real quickly. Hebrews 10, 25. And let us not neglect our meeting together. Let us not neglect our meeting together. Well, there's a barometer. Do you neglect the meeting together of the body? As some people do, but encourage one another, especially now that the day of his return is drawing near. Do you know the time is short? I know preachers have been saying that throughout all of history. I know that. But if, if they said it 100 years ago, my saying it now is even more true. The time's shorter now than it was then. Amen. Look, Luke 6, 38. Give and it will be given you. Good measure, pressed down, shaken together, running over, will be put into your lap for with the measure you use will be measured back to you. The measure with which you give. Now, I'm not talking about just money here. I'm talking about your life. I'm talking about your faith. I'm talking about sharing and giving what you know about Jesus. Matthew 28, starting verse 17. And when they saw him, they worshipped him, but some doubted. And Jesus came and said to them, them that doubted, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go, therefore, and make disciples. All you that are saved here, these that, are, that doubt, share with them. Those throughout the world, share with them. All authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. How much authority? All. Where? Heaven. heaven and earth. Does that pretty much cover it? <laughs> Go, therefore, and make disciples of all the nations. He didn't say go make converts. We as Baptists, and I do too, I get so excited about seeing somebody come to know the Lord. I do. I'm I'm fired up about that. But if we leave those babies on the curb, unattended and uncared for and unfed, they're going to die. And that's why we do what we do in this church. That's why we do what we do at Veritas Bible Institute. Go, therefore, and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to obey or observe, two translations, all that I have commanded you. And behold, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. That's a pretty sweet promise right there. Now, assuming that... the, the you have a real evidence-based faith. What is salvation? Salvation, biblically, is deliverance from danger or suffering. Salvation is talked about in two ways, biblically. Salvation is talked about like among the captives in Egypt, the slaves in Egypt, that they were redeemed out of slavery. They were saved. So there's a physical salvation that's taking place there. But more often than not, biblically, the word salvation is attributed to an eternal salvation that saves you from what? Eternal hell. Saves you from your own sin. That condemns you to hell. We've got to get the order right here. (laughs) It's our sin that condemns us to hell. And he says, I'm going to save you from the repercussions of that sin. Yeah. 
So we, we've got to understand what our, it's our problem. Our problem is our sin. I was born a sinner, and I've chosen to sin. And I need a Savior. Salvation is deliverance from danger or suffering. In the case of, of a spiritual salvation, it is an eternal danger of suffering. The word carries with it the idea of victory or health or, or preservation, being preserved, being upheld. Salvation concerns an eternal spiritual deliverance. When Paul told the Philippian jailer that what he must do to be saved, he was referring to the jailer's eternal destiny, Acts 16, where we've already been. What are we saved from? In Christian doctrine of salvation, we're saved from wrath of God, that is God's judgment of our sin. So the consequence of our sin is God's wrath. I don't know about you, but I, when I came to understand that, I wanted to be saved from that. What I, when I look biblically at what God's wrath looks like, and I understand that my sin ignites his wrath, I want to be saved from that. I want a relationship with him that's different than that. What are we saved from? From his wrath, from judgment of sin, that is eternal judgment. Look at Romans 5 and, and 1 Thessalonians 5. Both referencing back to our study on Wednesday nights of Revelation. Our sin has separated us from God. And we're saved from that, that separation. Every time you see the word death in the Bible, listen to me very carefully. Every time you see the word death in the Bible, what it's talking about is separation. In this case, separation from God. Eternal hell is eternal separation from him and all that he is, the goodness and the mercy and the love and the grace. Biblical salvation refers to our deliverance from the consequences of sin and therefore involves the removal of sin. One day, well, let me, let me give this to you this way, quickly. Salvation comes in three parts biblically. Salvation, past tense. I'm, the day that, that I accepted Jesus Christ, I was accepting his justification, what he did for me on the cross. That's past tense. I am now being saved, present tense. That is sanctification. Every day of my life, becoming more and more sanctified. And then I, one day I will be saved, and that's when I breathe my last breath and I go into his hands. And I'm eternally there in his presence. I have been saved, I am being saved, and I will be saved. I will be redeemed out of this place. I've been saved, past tense, from the judgment of sin. I'm being saved now from the temptation of sin, and I will be saved one day from being removed from the very presence of sin. That's what salvation looks like, biblically. Who does the saving? Only God can remove sin and deliver us from sin's penalty. 2 Timothy 1.9 and Titus 3.5. How does God save? The Christian doctrine of salvation, God has rescued us through Christ. That is the only way we can be saved. There are not many roads to salvation. There's not many roads to heaven according to the word of God. There's only one. John 14, 6. Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. Nobody comes to the Father except by me. And so all these people say, well, I believe the Bible, but I also believe this other thing that contradicts that statement that says all roads lead to heaven. There's something wrong there. You can't have an exclusive truth claim and then say everybody's getting there. Well, I just believe God loves everybody so much he wouldn't let anybody go to hell. He loves you enough to give you free will and choice. And you make your own choice. That's how much he loves you. He, didn't, he doesn't love you so much to make you a robot. I'm going to force you to do this. I programmed you.
how do we receive salvation? We are saved by faith, according to Ephesians 2, 8, and 9. First, we must hear the gospel of the good news of Jesus, death and resurrection. You need to hear the gospel. You need to know the truth. And then you need to receive the truth. And you've got that choice. It's your free will. Choose one way or the other. Choose this day who you will serve. As for me and my house, we'll serve the Lord. Then we must believe that it means to fully trust the Lord Jesus, Romans 1, 16. This involves repentance. What is repentance? To turn and go the other way. Well, I believe that all that stuff you're telling me, Pastor, but I just enjoy living like hell every day. Well, then you don't believe it. You have an intellectual assent to it. You believe that, but you haven't believed in. Believing in is what salvation is all about. The deliverance by the grace of God from eternal punishment from sin, which is granted to those who accept by faith God's conditions for repentance and faith in the Lord Jesus. But do I have to, re- how do I have to repent from my sins? Don't I just trust in Jesus? Well, let me say this to answer that question. If I, if I, have, to re- if I have to repent, if I have to turn and go on the way, is, is that not about works? Am I not doing works then in order to earn my way to salvation? That's a good question. It's a legitimate question. Here's the answer. If you have had faith and believed in this definition, fully trusted the Lord Jesus, then you will repent. You will have a desire to repent. Your hunger and your thirst will long to repent. You will have an overwhelming rush and excitement when you repent. It's done by your free will. Does that clear it up for anybody? I hope I'm not just talking to myself this morning. Salvation is available in Jesus alone, John 14, 6, Acts 4, 12, and is dependent on God alone for provision, assurance, and security. Each saved person freely.